Well, the clock tells me that either it's on its way to the 10 o'clock or it's just after 9. So one way or the other, I think I'll get us started. Uh, welcome. We're so glad to have you here this morning. I'm Diane Zimmerman. I'm the director of the National Center for the Study of University Engagement in University Outreach and Engagement here at MSU, which is always a handful to say, and I have no acronym to shorten any of that. The National Center for the Study of University Engagement is the sponsor for the Engaged Scholars Series, and we started last year, and we look at a variety of topics and bring engaged scholars from across the country to address um, both uh, faculty and staff and speakers here, as well as we often have guests from the public and from uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, we are this morning, of course, having a very specific conversation on faculty at work, and we are so very, very glad to um, bring to us both a uh, research uh, faculty member at Washington State and a graduate assistant from there. Before I introduce them and tell you a little bit about the day and the morning and how we're going to proceed, I need to thank our co-sponsors. We are always delighted when we have co-sponsors from across the various units, and we go on and specifically invite different ones that are appropriate to our topic of the day. Specifically, we'd like to thank the Dr. Mildred B. Erickson Distinguished Chair in Higher Adult and Lifelong Education, held as its first appointee, Ann Austin. And she's been very, very helpful in the planning for today's sessions as well. The College of Nursing, the Family Resource Center, which if you don't know, you should get to know. They have lots of information. And the Women's Resource Center in White Park. Our engaged scholars for today and throughout the day for a variety of sessions. First are Dr. Kelly Ward, the Associate Professor of the Department of Educational Leadership and Counseling Psychology at Washington State University. And with her is Tammy Moore, PhD student and research assistant in Higher Education Administration and Cultural Studies, also at Washington State. And actually, I think you crossed back and forth as a research assistant between the two. That they seem like programs in the same department. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Professor Ward, if you will read the um, flyer that you got, and then we have also her Vita up if you would like to look at it, is interested in faculty issues. Specifically, what we're going to hear about this morning is the uh, integration of teaching, research, and service. And she's also interested in work and family concerns, which is the topic of this afternoon's session. She's interested in faculty development and has done work in service learning and service roles in higher education as well. I became, I became aware of her, one, through our graduate assistant, Angela Allen, who will be assisting this morning, and also through her 2003 book, Faculty Service Roles and the Scholarship of Engagement, yay, <laughs> published by Jazzy Bass. <clears throat> More recently, Kelly has co-authored Putting Students First, How Colleges Develop Students Purposefully, a 2005 anchor publishing book. She has also an article on academic work and motherhood, uh, managing complex roles, to say the least. That's in the 2004 review of uh, the higher, ed higher education. And she serves as a board member on the Association for the Study of Higher Education, ASH. Before Washington State, Kelly was a faculty member at Oklahoma State, University of Montana, and a research center uh, assistant at the Center for the Study of Higher Education at Penn State where she earned her PhD. Now, Tammy. Tammy Moore is a graduate research assistant in both the higher ed program and the Department of Ed Leadership and Counseling site. She has conducted research with Kelly and um, others on balancing family and tenure, a five-year follow-up study funded by the American Association of University Women. In addition, in addition to her research with Professor Ward, on uh, today's topic, faculty integration of research, teaching, and service. Kelly is conducting work on models for transformative community university partnerships. And I believe, Tammy, you're going to work some with the graduate assistants um, from the Hale Department this afternoon as a little breakout session. And she has played various roles in nonprofit groups as well. So she brings both the academy and the uh, uh, external audience perspective to her work. Now, this morning, I have housekeeping work to do now, okay? <laughs> This morning we are having first a presentation, PowerPoint, and then we will have a break, 
And after the break, we're going to divide into a workshop. This is a long session, so we've decided that we would like to do some workshop things and then a report back at the end of that. At the end of that, there is a lunch. I think many of you have already replied that you will be attending. I surely hope that you have. Um, just for, uh, particularly for conversation with Hale students, higher adult and lifelong education program students and faculty with Kelly and Tammy and any others of you that wish to join us. This afternoon, we'd like to invite you back for the afternoon session on work and family. And then there's a reception from five to six. Now the rooms have sort of changed, so watch where they are, and I'm sure that the handout in your packet now has the correct rooms, so follow those please. And one last housekeeping. I think you should have gotten a parking pass. We go from the glorious and the elegant, don't we, to the very important. <laughs> um, if you go in and out, uh, keep the parking pass, tell the gatekeeper that you are keeping it for the day. It is an all, on, all day long one, so you don't need to keep turning it in and getting a new one. All right, we would like to start. I want to thank you so much, both Kelly and Tammy, for joining us. We so enjoy the Engaged Scholar Series, and we are so looking forward to hearing what you have to teach us and then what we can learn together in our workshop sessions. Great, thanks. Well, thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Um, when you're in, in the area of higher education, the Michigan State program is um, one of fame and glory, so it's nice to be here with colleagues from um, Michigan State and just to come to the campus. And yesterday, in an unsolicited conversation, I was talking to one of my colleagues who um, is at Washington State. He works for the Center for Bridging the Digital Divide, and he was on his way to Mississippi to give a talk about workforce development in um, the South. And so he asked me where I was going, and I said I was coming to Michigan State. And he said, I think Michigan State is one of the top land-grant universities, and I think they really take seriously their service and outreach mission. And he didn't even know I was coming here to give a talk on the topic. So I said, good answer. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, I thought you should know that the campus is really known for that. And he's, he's not in a person who studies and thinks about engagement per se. He really comes at that from a perspective of sociology and from a perspective of technology and workforce development. So I wanted to point that out. So I thought that was an appropriate um, comment from him. So I wanted to start by why are we here? Um, about one of the things that Diane didn't mention in my introduction, at the University of Montana, I worked as the director of service learning. And I also worked with Campus Compact there. Is everybody familiar with Campus Compact? It's a consortium of presidents. That's always one of my barometers of how far we've come with regard to service, if people know what Campus Compact is. Um, it's a 20-year-old organization. It's a consortium of presidents who have pledged themselves to adv further advancing and re-enlivening the mission of service on college campuses. And so um, my first job after graduate school was doing faculty development for the newly formed Montana Campus Compact. And so one of the things I did in that position is drove around Montana, which is a very big and beautiful state. So I had, I would go from campus to campus and talk to faculty, talk to students, talk to administrators about how they might incorporate service learning uh, onto their campus, how they might think about community-based research and that type of thing. And one of the things um, I would start out a lot of times saying is when I say service, what comes to mind? And inevitably people would say committee work. And I'm like, no, 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 we want to think about service in a different way. So, um, and also as a student of higher education, when I thought about the history of higher education, I thought, you know, service is not something new. You know, in the early 90s, we really were talking about service and service learning as something brand new and different in higher education. And still now, a lot of times when I go and I give talks and I talk to faculty, when I say service in terms of teaching research and service, they don't really think of public service, community service, outreach, engagement. They still think of it as something that you do in terms of shared governance to help the university run. And that was one of my motivations for, um, I wasn't really bringing this book as sort of shameless self-promotion, but I will because I think it's an underutilized resource. Um, and one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I really felt like um, how we talked about service was really underdeveloped and that 
we had not been talking about it in what I thought were the most expansive ways to really think about how to com how to connect campus and communities through community service and for faculty to think about their jobs in those regards. And I, and I still think we have work to do in that so that when we talk to faculty members and we say, what is it that you do, that they actually think of their work in integrated ways and also think of what they do being relevant to the community. So that was one of the motivations for getting involved in the project that we're going to talk about today was to find out how it is that faculty, people who think about their work with a community backdrop in ways that integrates teaching, research, and service. That we don't think about teaching, research, service, and then community service as something else to do, but ways that we can integrate that. And I know that when I used to talk to people about doing service learning and being involved in community-oriented projects, people would say, oh, not another thing. We, we have too many things going on. We can't keep adding things to our plate. Um, and I really had thought, and I, I still really strongly believe this, is that if we think about community as a backdrop to our work, it, we're actually not adding another thing. So that community service is not a fourth category, per se, but it's actually a way to integrate the other aspects of what it is that faculty do. Um, one of the other reasons motivations for getting involved in this project um, is a way to advance the scholarship related to outreach and engagement. I do a lot of reviews of grant proposals and also of um, journal publications. And a lot of the things written about that tie to service have really to do, they highlight individual projects. And I was thinking of this last night because this publication here is a beautiful um, and very powerful overview of different projects that people are involved in and what impact they have on the community. And it, it's, it's great work. But one of the things we don't have is sort of a macro picture. So if we put together all these different projects, how is it that this involvement in the community is changing how we think about faculty work? Is it changing institutions? To really have a macro picture. So I, I've been feeling for a while that we need to get to the next stage of research and engagement by stepping back from project-oriented um, research and looking at individual projects, individual campuses, and actually starting to look more across disciplines and across campuses and, and start to think about what impact this is having <coughs> on faculty in, in general. And I, if we want to have engagement in community service as something that we talk about in, in sort of a normalized way, and it seems like at Michigan State that's more the case, and I think um, it's a, a sign of progress that my colleague yesterday said Michigan State really has it going on with regard to service. But nationally, that's not necessarily <coughs> the case. It also really varies by discipline. In certain disciplines, you say service learning, you say community-based research, and that's not something that they're interested in at all or that they, they know much about. So my hope is in engaging in this project and projects like these that we can start to have community work be sort of a normal part of how we talk about faculty work instead of it being something other, something that you have to spend a lot of time explaining. And I think the way that we can get there is by um, doing more research that has more of a macro kind of picture. So um, we went into this project asking, uh, what does it take to be community minded in teaching research and service? And then also, in light of traditional notions of scholarship, how is it that faculty reconcile work they do in the community and also institutional expectations for promotion and tenure and for faculty work? And then also, why is it that people do this? You know, we all have a lot going on. What is it that motivates people to take their work into the community and take their disciplinary expertise into the community? So we started out, um, certainly Ernest Boyer and his work in Scholarship Reconsidered has been key to um, connecting the resources of campuses to the community. He was um, one of the main first people that started to say, you know, scholarship has come to, me to mean research, publication, getting grants. But historically, that's not really what scholarship is. And we, and we can really think about it in, in broader terms. And then um, one of the things that I have, that I did in that book I did on um, faculty service roles 
was to say that we need to think about service not as something else, but as something that we do in an integrative way. And then also, um, one of the things that, as a result of being engaged in this project, is this is really about culture, the culture of campuses, the culture of the profession, the culture of disciplines. And so that, um, some of the different theoretical work about culture in higher education has helped drive how we've been thinking about this work. Because ultimately, I think what is called for is a shift in the culture of the academic profession so that we can think about it in broader ways um, that go beyond sort of the traditional teaching, research, and service, and then the traditional definitions of research, that for it to be research, it needs to look a certain way. It needs to be um, it used to advance the discipline. Uh, it's basically by researchers, for researchers, and about researchers. And so I think we, to, to really push this further, we need to change the culture, the faculty subculture in particular. So I'm going to turn it over to Tammy right now, and then um, we'll talk about the study and the findings. We put together a study that is qualitative in nature. And I was thinking about this earlier. It's, we followed a protocol that, that put together or started with ethnographic interviews. And then it dawned on me that the majority of our interviews were done on the telephone. So it might be more accurate to say that it's somewhat of a modified ethnographic interview. Um, I did spend some time on the uh, websites of the folks who are the participants in our study to try to get a sense of their institution as the context for their work, and that was one of the questions that we asked. But I wanted to acknowledge that I didn't go spend time with 25 people, so I can't report to you a fully ethnographic um, presentation of, of their experience. Um, in addition to the telephone interviews that I did, um, we also collected document samples from them. We asked them to provide us with the current curriculum vita with a research statement, um, and most often that came from the most recent, either an, if they had to write a narrative for an annual evaluation or a narrative that they put together for their most recent promotion or tenure process. And then the final thing that we collected from them was we asked for an example of their scholarship that they felt was representative of the integrated approach that they were taking. Most often that was an article, something that they had written. There are people who participated in this study whose scholarly work is not necessarily an article. It's something more along the line of a creative piece. We had a couple of folks in design fields um, who said, well, you know, look, I don't write about what I do. I draw about it. Let me, let me show you a, a product that my students and I have put together. So we, we looked at some of those things as well. Um, there were, as I said, there are 25 participants in this study. 23 of them were tenure line faculty members, and then two people were uh, had teaching faculty appointments that were not tenure track. And how we um, identified these people is I started with uh, contacting folks who were, in some instances, pioneers in the service learning movement, and asked them, who do you know at the national level that, that are doing work that you would consider in, an integration of research, service, and teaching? And an interesting thing that happened is I specifically said we wanted to talk to people who had teaching appointments who were in tenure track positions. And they said, OK, great. Here you go. Here's some folks you should talk to. And in two instances, when people talked to me about what their appointment was and how that was structured, it was different than what their, their persona is amongst their, their um, colleagues, which was very interesting. Um, they were all at research institutions. There, across the group of 25 people, we had people at all ranks. We had, I've been an assistant professor for two years. We've had, I've been at this institution for 30 years. Um, and that was a, an intentional piece of the uh, process of putting together the sample. In addition to the variety in terms of the rank of the faculty, there were also um, a wide spectrum in terms of institutions within that research category. So there were, there were about a third of the study at land-grant institutions. There was another third who were at non-land-grant institutions. A couple of those people were, uh, actually three of those people were at private institutions. And then we also interviewed um, about a third of the group were at institutions that were essentially the flagship and the land-grant in that state. Um, we wanted to put together this, this sample that 
varied in all of these different ways so that we weren't looking at the typical institution or the typical discipline. And in fact, what we found is even at the schools that are considered you know, the leaders in this area, or oh, that's the field that everybody does it in, those people were, were talking about the same kinds of challenges uh, around their work or the same sorts of issues that were coming up from people at institutions or in disciplines that you might consider sort of far removed. So the, you know, the message here is that really there's no such thing as the typical place to do this work or the typical discipline in which it happens. Um, we uh, talked to people specifically who included service learning or some kind of experiential learning in their teaching. So the other piece that came out, uh, both as we put together the sample and in the analysis, is that frequently you'll see uh, there's a discussion of service learning because that's an important piece of how we found the people and what they were doing. Um, in terms of the analysis, the way it worked is that first we constructed uh, portraits of each individual participant, so 25 of those, using portraiture methodology that some of you may be familiar with. It's the work of Sarah Lightfoot. Sarah Lawrence. Lawrence, Lawrence Lightfoot. Lawrence Lightfoot. I always get her name in the wrong one. Um, and so we, those portraits were constructed by doing a constant comparison method analysis of the transcripts, the verbatim transcripts of the interviews, and then looking also at the documentary evidence that that uh, we collected to begin to get something that, um, to begin to pull together portraits, as I said, of each of those participants to look at the themes across what they were saying in their interviews as well as how they wrote about the work that they were doing. The codes that we identified in the constant comparison um, approach to that data analysis were then used to recode all of this data and identify the themes in that data. So the themes that we are going to talk about today um, are, are what came out of this analysis process. And I want to talk to you about the first two of them. So across our study, there were four themes that we heard people talking consistently about, and really strongly across everyone's transcripts. Um, we heard people talking about reclaiming the role of educator. So really not conceptualizing themselves as researchers. People talked about what they did in a more educative, educative sense rather than this is the research that I do. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about how that played out in a second. Um, this is also very clearly work that people are passionate about. And that was extremely obvious. I, I was sharing with somebody, I just presented on this research last week at another conference, and I was sharing with people that a couple of, of these interviews, I was crying on the phone. I was so moved by the stories people were telling me and the passion that they have for the work that they do. It was really an amazing experience to talk to them. Um, it's also work that people describe as being on the margins of their discipline, on the margins in their department. Um, they're frequently working with people who are sort of socially on the margins. Um, it, it's, it's marginalized work. It was very interesting to hear that. And then finally, the bottom line about what they do, how they do it, and how they think about what they do, and what their colleagues think about what they do, that's all within the context of the particular institution that they were at. Um, and in some instances, the discipline that they were in. So we heard about that as well. Um, so I was mentioning to you earlier that um, there was a really clear sense that our participants have are reconceptualizing their work as academics and really thinking of themselves as educators. So for example, one person said to me, my primary role is as an educator. I mean, that was page one of the transcript, that's what this person said. And another one explained it this way. What she said is that really, my work in the community is education. When I think about how I, how I do my work, I feel that a huge part of my job is as an, as an outreach person is as a design educator. So the, um, this community involvement then feeds into this larger view of gathering information, 
through the research process or whatever the scholarly work is that the person does in that particular field, and then in sharing it back out with the various stakeholders or cons constituents around the work that they're doing. Um, one person talked to us about their role saying that, look, what I do is educate the decision makers. This person works in a context where they do a lot of policy work with people in state agencies. But very, very clearly how he talked about it was that he was, this was an education process. Um, and what he said to me about that was that the university owes itself, owes the communities around it to be partners. Because the things that we learn on campus, we've got to translate to them outside. It's not just what we learn in our labs. It's not just technology transfer and engineers selling patents to the outside and developing new equipment. It's about the ideas. Now, Kelly and I, just to kind of let you, this, this will be your little snap, uh, bird's eye view into our discussions that we've had in, in working on this data. It's been really difficult to determine which of these two um, themes, the one about reclaiming the role of educator, or this about pers people pursuing their own passion and their research, it's hard to say which one of those comes first. Um, and it, it really does vary from one person to the next. The bottom line, though, is that the work that people are doing, it's really who they are. It, we hear them express it in a way that this is who I am as a person. One woman said to me, all the people who can do this are people who have a passion or have some other thing that motivates them. It might be a responsibility, a sense of giving back, a sense of citizenship, a need to connect resources with people. <clears throat> We're going to do it anyway, regardless. So regardless of what role, regardless of the institutional constraints, this is the work that we're passionate about, and it's the work that we're going to be doing. Um, and really, that passion then in turn fuels their sense of purpose as faculty member. It, it's the thing that continues to motivate them in the face of whatever challenge the tra challenges there are, whether that's within their institutional context or in their individual work with communities or the time-consuming nature of the work, they're saying, it, it doesn't matter because this is so important to me. Um, and most of them talked about this as the really compelling piece that brought them to the integration. So they said, another person said to me, and this is somebody uh, late in her career reflecting back on when she came into her faculty role. She said, I knew I had to come up with a research agenda as a brand new teacher. And I wanted it to be an agenda that would be working in conjunction with community-based organizations so that when I poured all my soul into this scholarship, as I had to do to get tenure, it would be something that somebody might be able to use. So shifting a little bit to some um, more institutional perspectives, one of the things we found is that people are doing a lot of this work on the margins, which is not really a surprise, especially at research universities where we still are bound by traditional notions of <coughs> scholarship. Um, but people really, one person said to us, I'm, I'm a different animal. People don't know what to do with me. Um, so it, it's not clear a lot of times how it is that we evaluate people's work in the community. And um, so people really saw they were working on the margins of their institutions and also the margins of um, the different definitions of teaching, research, and service. And on, on a lot of campuses, there are different forms that you have to fill out um, to document your annual progress or at two-year intervals or for tenure at the larger tenure process interval. And a lot of times, if this work, it, it's hard to define, it's hard to categorize where the community work is. So if you're involved in a community project and you um, produce a publication on that, it's, it's, you can categorize it there. But a lot of times, um, it was hard to c clearly to document this work because of how it did exist in the margins. And also, um, you know, a lot of people, I hear all the time that community problems happen in interdisciplinary ways that we, we can't really say that um, if we're talking about something like poverty or um, housing, that that really cuts across a lot of different issues. There's a planning aspect to housing. There's an architectural aspect to planning. There's a sociological aspect to that. 
so that this work happens in interdisciplinary ways. And I know um, most campuses are thinking in interdisciplinary ways, and certainly a lot of funding agencies are talking about things in interdisciplinary ways. However, um, a lot of most disciplines are still really bound in traditional ways of thinking, which was particularly problematic with regard to the external review process. So one person said to us, trying to find someone in my discipline who can understand what I'm doing with the community work is tough just because there are so few engineers that do it. So, um, and the external review process is a really important part, uh, in particular for people wanting to get tenure. Um, one of the sort of sub-themes to this working on the margin is that um, a lot of times it's faculty who are marginalized, um, who are doing work that's marginalized, and then they're working with marginalized people in the community. That after I was reading transcripts for a couple of days that sort of went, went on in my head and one of the things we found, have been finding out too, not really related to this project, but um, at some campuses that are really active in service learning and if you talk to service learning directors, one of the things that we've been finding out is that a lot of times it's part-time faculty and clinical faculty who are really actively engaged in service learning um, and that wasn't the case in this project because we are, we only talked to people who um, we're in full-time and mostly tenure-track appointments. But it's a little troubling to think of that service learning and service work is being done um, by people who are not sort of at the center of the institution. So um, one of the things we also found out is um, getting grants. A lot of times the people that we talked to had been very successful in the grant writing process, which of course is a traditional marker of success, especially at a research university. So a lot of times it was the getting of grants that shifted people from the margin to the center. And it was sometimes through the grants, too, that they suddenly got the attention of um, the vice provost for research, uh, the president. And so that, a lot of times, brought people into the fore. Um, although, as one person said, um, one of her colleagues was unhappy and had made it known to me that she was very unhappy that I was getting too much press. So there's a a delicate balance with getting um, the attention that came with doing community-based work. So one of the other, um, you know, these faculty member, these people are working within an institutional context. And they talked about working within the organizational boundaries, because what they're doing is not the coin of the realm. So um, again, if someone is moving along in their lab, they're getting grants, they're working with a lot of graduate students, postdocs, producing publications. That's the coin of the realm in a research university. So what these faculty members were doing, they viewed um, as not being that way. Yet they were working within an organizational context. So one of the things they talked about is having to manage the tension between the traditional research expectations of the campus as well as the community focus and how they went about doing that. Um, and then. There was also this, you know, a lot of campuses are fixated on, um, you know, how we rank, who we are, where we're headed, that type of thing. So people felt the need to produce, again, the traditional indicators of faculty productivity in addition to doing this community work. And I know that that's a real t tension point for most faculty who are involved in community-based work, especially if you're a tenure-track faculty member who wants to become a tenured person, or also if you're an associate professor who wants to become a full professor. Um, there is this call to um, produce those traditional kinds of things. And then also, um, one of the things that I thought was sort of interesting is the, the state imperatives that a, a lot of, especially public institutions, are aware of and what the state needs either was a great way to validate what people were doing, because community work really makes public the work of the disciplines, which I think is one of the most important parts of it. So if it really, if, if it fit in with a particular state mandate, then it was really celebrated and highlighted and, and pointed out as a great way to connect campus resources with community and state needs in the tradition of a land-grant institution in particular. Um, but also when faculty were involved in this work, it's very public, and if it didn't fit in with state needs, then people were a little concerned about how do I do this work and be really public about it and get press, and, and what if it's not a popular or um, viewed as valid kind of work, ha needing to manage that tension. And um, one of the other big findings, and this is something that I know that I've 
personally been concerned about is faculty members that we interviewed talked about the power of one and that particular presidents or provosts were very, very supportive of community-based initiatives. And what if that person leaves? What <coughs> impact is that going to have? And some, on some campuses, that person had left. And how is it that this can get beyond being the initiative of one person so that it's not so dictated by the president um, or the provost or a particular department chair or a particular dean, and that it really becomes part of the fabric of the institution? So people felt like they were really teetering on the edge of potentially this could suddenly become not such a good thing if the president left or if my department chair left who's very supportive and knows what I'm doing. So that there, it's still really a lot of times based in um, one person's support. Um, and that that also really tied into the reward structure because a lot of times it's one person who's a champion who then in turn um, drives changes in the reward structure. So what are we to make of these findings. So we have um, this expanded notion of education and what it means to be an educator. Educator, It's driven by people's passion that they would, they would be doing this kind of work whether they were in a community agency or they're, whether they're in a faculty position. And then, um, but the work is operating on the margins and it's also operating within a traditional research context. So um, one of the things that we've been looking at is, again, using that cultural perspective. And clearly, if we look at society as a whole, there are you know, all the different calls for accountability and accreditation. We really want to see how is it that faculty work is applicable. So I think if we talk about cult culture and society as a whole, um, the time is now, so to speak, and that I think this is getting a lot of validation. And then also um, institutions. I mean, the institutional support at a place like Michigan State is really um, not a trivial type, type of thing. I mean, campuses are really grabbing onto this and saying, OK, it, it, they like to see that faculty are involved in the community. Um, I think if we look at um, both the disciplines and also the academic profession from a cultural perspective, I think that's really, to me, I see where the next step that we need to push forward with this, that people are, the p faculty members that we talk to consider themselves successful with traditional ideas of scholarship and also with community-oriented kind of scholarship. But there's a lot of concern and there's a lot of tension in how to manage traditional ideas about what it means to be a faculty member. And then also doing this work that meets the traditional needs, but it also looks different. And that a lot of times people don't recognize what they're doing as being central to what it means to be a faculty member. It's central to what the university views as part of their mission. But a lot of times at the disciplinary level and at the department level, which is where a person um, is recommended for merit raises, also where they um, are recommended for promotion, that they're, that's where I think the culture needs to shift. And um, in having conversations about this, what would it take for us to get there? And um, that's something that we want to do in our workshop session a little bit later this morning is in terms of next steps, how is it that we can bring this kind of work more to the center of the institutions? And, and what is it going to take to shift the academic profession to recognize um, the kind of work that faculty do in the community in, sort of in traditional ways and also non-traditional ways? So perhaps um, I think we've taken kind of a modernistic approach in the engagement movement, that it's another thing that we've been talking about. It's kind of another thing that we add to what faculty members are doing. And you know, in, in some ways, I think we could say we're making great progress and that campuses really have changed how they're thinking about faculty work. But I think in other ways, and one of the things I see from this research is that faculty are doing it um, not necessarily because of the institutional environment, but to a certain extent in spite of it, that it's really their personal passion that drives this. It's not necessarily um, the culture as a whole. So perhaps more postmodern definitions of, and I have students say, now, what would a postmodern university look like? Um, and I'm not always sure what that would look like, but um, I think it, it, it does, what I see is that if we put the community work at the center and, and we view that as an educational process, then we might be able to think about the teaching that people do and the research that they do in a slightly different way instead of saying that this community, this community work 
sort of another aspect to what we do, which I think is a more modernistic way and more rational way of approaching faculty incorporation of community into their work. So um, I just leave you with thinking about how that might look as we sort of continue on the conversation about having faculty involved in community and being community minded about their work, how alternative perspectives on organizations might help us do that. And um, you know, I think in the spirit of Boyer, you know, he really thought a broadened vision of scholarship could help bring, connect the resources of campuses with the needs of communities. And certainly the faculty members that we have talked to as a result of this project have taken that call passionately. And so um, I think new perspectives might encourage people. It's, and I don't, I don't want this research to be that well, these people are exemplars, and if you do what they do, then you can do it too. Because um, I, I think that can be helpful to provide portraits of how people do this. But I also want this to be a way to really shift thinking about um, the academic profession. So with that, we wanted to see if anybody has any questions before we transition into talking more specifically about different stakeholders and their involvement in community-based work. Um, of the folks you talked to, were they mostly people who seemed to be good at or excellent at sort of traditional faculty roles and this work was what they did on top of it? Um, or was there anybody who really seemed to fully center in a more sort of postmodern sense this community work as the center of their academic career? And if so, third part, were they seen as successful departmentally? There was a pretty big range. I'm going to turn that question over to Tammy. I mean, there was a big range of people in terms of where people were in their career and sort of coming in with this as a driving mission versus people who had sort of added this on as they went along the way or as a result of seeing a particular need in the community, then they had a refocus. Or rethought their work. So um, what I would say about that is I would go back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that I, the way that we identified these participants is I, I asked service learning directors on particular campuses and people and who have a nationals perspective to help me identify folks. So very much the group is perceived by their peers as really centering the um, integration. It was interesting that maybe a third of them didn't specifically said, I don't really feel like I'm integrating. Um, there are six or seven people, six people in this group who have won national awards to recognize their work in this area. So that's an, that's an interesting, what people perceive you as doing and what you see yourself as doing are not necessarily the same thing. But there were several people, the last quote that I shared with you, the woman talking about, you know, when I started, I knew I had to put together an agenda that would, um, you know, prepare me well to go up for tenure and for promotions, but I also wanted it to make a difference in the community. She was representative um, of several people in this study who really ha looked at how can what I do make a difference? And that, mo that sort of motivation then got linked with a real purposeful and intentional integration of their work. Um, and I think that person in particular would be a good example of somebody who, she has another quote, uh, there's another place in her transcript where she talks about you know, look, I've been given a distinguished chair in my school. And that she saw that in, as an example of how, she said, this is an example of how my college recognizes this crazy thing that I do. So there were a couple of people actually in the sample who were distinguished chairs. Um, she earned one as she was, or was recognized with one as she was going through. Another person who, the other distinguished chair, is somebody who later in his career had has just completely reconceptualized how he does his work, much to the chagrin of his highly ranked department's faculty members who don't really understand why he's not writing in you know, his very specific journal area. But certainly for the faculty members, um, it, especially involved in the tenure process, you know, there is a tension between sort of doing what you have to do traditionally to get tenure and then doing this too, so that it looks like two parts of the research process. But what happens often is, that as a result of the work that they're doing in the community, basically they're producing two kinds of artifacts. One that goes to the disciplinary journal, and then one um, that might be a report to a state agency. It might be 
um, presentations that they're doing to the local community organization, um, hearings that they're part of in the local community, so that the same source of data, so to speak, would be produced in both outlets, in traditional outlets and then community-oriented outlets. I'm, I'm wondering about what you think of the other critics of higher education, huh? people like Stanley Katz and Kate Stinson, who say that the big faculty problem at the <coughs> university is the inattention to any undergraduate teaching and neglect of liberal and general education. So what would be the best argument for paying any attention at all to this in relation to that, given the limits on time and attention that, mm -hmm. that people have? Actually, um, I'm curious, by the way, how many of the people you interviewed actually were active in the undergraduate program of teaching general and liberal education programs? And what the choice to do one or the other says about their understanding of faculty work at research universities? Mm -hmm. I think this role of an educator, um, it's kind of interesting that you're asking that question because when I was looking at the transcripts and thinking about this role of educator, I was actually quite pleased with how much these faculty members at research universities really saw that as a result of getting involved in the community, how it was really reframing their work with students, both undergraduate and graduate How many students you teach in liberal and general education programs? How many teach undergraduate regularly? particularly underclassmen, freshmen and sophomores. Mm -hmm. that, that's a critical part of understanding how they, how they see faculty work, especially research universities, mm -hmm. where as many people say now that's the crucial problem in teaching and learning, not what people are doing off campus. I'd say that there are at least two-thirds of the people who regularly teach undergraduates. They're probably, and I didn't specifically ask at what level, I just asked them to tell me about their courses. So sometimes people would volunteer, this is a whatever level course. Um, probably 40% of them are teaching freshmen or sophomores. And the people who are not teaching undergraduates, all of them but about two are people who are teaching in programs that don't have undergraduate students in them. And then there was a, one person who talked about who is is in that situation? She has an appointment in a graduate school of education, and she said that her she talked about that her colleagues are particularly um, well. I don't, she didn't use the word frustrated, but she talked about making the decision and actively choosing to teach undergraduates, where that was not an expectation of her well, role. That she it, thought to you, what do you yourself think about the allocation of attention in this regard? Where the action should be at research universities? Well, I mean, the one thing about this project is we're talking about teaching, too. That this is not just changing how people do research, but it's also changing how they do teaching. Yeah, but more than happened when not in the undergraduate classroom, and it doesn't have any impact on what other critics of the university say is the primary problem. But if you look at the, the larger research about service learning right. that is looking at, um, you know, and service learning is being seen as one way to reframe the relationship between faculty and students and getting people involved in the community and to re-enliven the curriculum, I think that has very positive implications on that argument. So that it's, this is not just changing how faculty think about research, but it's also changing how faculty think about teaching and the relationship with students. And I was just involved in a different project, and it was, it was at liberal arts colleges, which I think is a little bit of a different relationship with regard to undergraduate students and their relationship with faculty. But there, um, a big finding in that project is getting off campus with students is what is making liberal education real. When you're out, you know, and you're taking students on, and you're going on these weekend long projects, or you're going um, on spring break and you're involved in a service project, that's really where the teaching and learning process is happening. So I think in, in that way, I think there's a lot of hope in this regard and um, responding to how that work with undergraduate students can become exciting. And you know, I think there's a real sense of looking at working with undergraduate students as a chore in a research university. And I think that's where that criticism comes from. And I think as a result of getting involved in this kind of work, you can students become involved in the research process. Um, it changes their perspective on the discipline. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in this work as well. Good question. If you could speak to the um, academic disciplines that were represented in your study and also the extent to which you see your findings being applicable to academic disciplines across universities. Mm -hmm. Well, we were very purposeful to incorporate people 
you know, not from sort of what I think of as the typical and easy places to do this, social work, nursing, teaching. And so um, we were intentional about including a range. I, I was thinking that we should have actually had a slide on the disciplines they were in. So we had people from engineering. Um, do you want to talk about more of the breakdown of that? Uh, engineering, architecture, law, landscape architecture, so some design fields and graphic, graphic designer, um, somebody who did, a couple of people who did urban and regional planning. Uh, let's see, you said, we said engineering. Uh, there were some people in, in education programs. There were historians. Um, communications. One person is affiliated with the science tech, uh, with the STEM program um, at the undergraduate level and also is, has a role in graduate education around community engagement. Um, English, foreign languages and literature. I think that's it. And I tried, one of the things that we tried to do in putting together the list of participants was to, as much as I could, have more than one person in a discipline so that we weren't having somebody be the voice of whatever. Um, and so we were able to do that to a certain extent. Um, and then I think you also had a question about how these themes go across discipline. I, I, they absolutely do. I mean, we didn't, we didn't see things spiking that was only applicable to whatever. And I think in certain di disciplines, like engineering comes to mind in particular, where this is more of an anomaly and the discipline as a whole. A lot of disciplines, um, through some of the work of Campus Compact and um, the American Association of Higher Education, God rest its soul, which is no longer in place, um, but they had worked with a lot of different disciplines, like the American Chemical Society, um, the Modern Language Association, the American Communications Association, um, the American Historical Association. They have actually come forward with sort of statements about outreach and engagement. So um, it, it hasn't been uncommon over the past five or six years that there be keynotes about this or that there were statements that came forward about how to, what does outreach look like? What's it look like with regard to teaching? What's it look like with regard to research? So I think that taken hold, like in communications right now, it's, it's really part of the discourse in communication, more so than it is in engineering. So I think in that way, um, it, it, there is some variation by discipline in terms of how familiar it is that it, it is and do you have colleagues that understand it. Because there's a big concern with that not just that I do it and that my department, my, my department chair thinks it's good and that the president gave me an award, but also that there's national recognition. Because at research universities in particular, the faculty members are not just members of a campus, they're members of a disciplinary culture. Go ahead. Um, I have a, and this comes from, from my being new to the, to the scholarship of engagement. Um, what does engagement, how would you define it? I was going to ask you that, and then at the end of your, of your, of your presentation, you said connecting resources, the research of the campus, with the needs of communities. Is that what you see as engagement? Yes. I would define that. I mean, when I, engagement, outreach, public service, I mean, a lot of these words are used interchangeably. I can refer you to my book because I spend quite a bit of time in that book <laughs> defining that. But I think engagement is a word that is used as a way to think broadly about engaging the resources of the community, or engaging the resources of the campus with the community. Which brings, brings up the point and, and, and in your little misstep right there, it seems like the flow is only in one direction. And that's what's concerning me as I'm listening. Um, that it goes from the university as sort of the, the place with the knowledge, the sound mm -hmm. of, 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 of sense and, and, and solution to a place of need and, 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 and reception. Right. And I wonder about that, and I wonder about it for a number of reasons, one of which is if we find that the individual researcher, the individual educator, the individual academic has this tension of not being able to integrate these various functions into, into a role 
because the institution itself is not ready to, to accept it. And I do agree with you that it is a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. Then I think we need to, to alter also the idea that we learn from the community right. and that people from those the community have a place in our university and right. in our education. I, I, I would understand them that's what engaged learning is about and that they have a place in, in designing not only um, some of the university standards but also some of the standards for what, what promotion and what, what excellence really means. Right. Um, you know, so that we change the university and, rather than trying to change the individuals within, within this fairly um, intractable institution. Right. And that notion of reciprocity, I mean, is an important part of engagement. I think that's one of the reasons people have used the word engagement instead of outreach or instead of public service, because words like public service really, um, and outreach, do connote I'm outreaching to you. And engagement does convey more of a reciprocal relationship so that the, the resources of the community are also coming in to the campus. But I think that's a really big challenge and it, it really comes up with grants so if you really if you want a community partner to be on a grant for example that's such a quandary for institutions so I, I think we're getting there but it it's going to take a while in terms of having that two-way streaks I think the institution still wants to own the knowledge but I think if you look at individual partnerships, um, certainly that are highlighted in this engaged scholar brochure generated from Michigan State that I think is in your packet, um, and also some of the faculty members that we interviewed, the, the relationships they have with the community partners truly are a partnership. A lot of times they team teach the classes so that there's a mutual engagement with the students. Um, they meet in off-campus locations so that it does break down that barrier that exists between the traditional notion of town and gown. I think the point is if we put the community problem or the community issue in the center, then the faculty member, the student, the community members are all equal around that table. Everybody's engaged in the teaching and learning process. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I can add a couple things just in terms of uh, references. You know, I mentioned earlier that I was just at this conference last week. And Nadine Cruz, who some of you may recognize as the former director of the Haas Public Service Center at Stanford, was our final keynote. And she talked specifically on this issue about, um, well, and the notion of being the heart of higher education. She, the compelling uh, image that she gave us that I found most compelling, she said, you know, if we could imagine that all of the knowledge that is needed to solve the world's problems, to address all of the issues going on in the world, is this circle. And she has a PowerPoint with this circle on it. And then there's this tiny little pie shape. And she acknowledges that this tiny pie, that's the knowledge that exists in academia. And that everything else is outside of that. And we talked about what all those things were. And then we talked about higher ed as um, or the institutions of higher education as, as really having a role in replicating hierarchy and having some of those sorts of issues. And so uh, you may find her work to be helpful as you think about this. The other example that I would mention to you that I think you'll find very helpful on this issue is the work of Ken Reardon in the East St. Louis um, Action Research Project through the University of Illinois. So he was at the University of Illinois, uh, SLARP, which is the ac acronym, um, is celebrating its 20th anniversary. This either this year or last year. Um, and he and I also saw him speak, and he's currently involved with the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, helping them with the rebuilding efforts. But it, what he talks about is that in that in the work in East St. Louis, that the thing that turned the corner for that, that partnership between the university and the community, um, and the community organizations, was not action research, was not, you know, there were lots of sort of ideas about things that are traditionally thought of within the academy. But what happened was when they began to look at popular education models and some of the work that was done at the Highlander Center or has been done at the Highlander Center uh, and Miles Horton and Palafrieri's work and some of the direct organizing tactics or um, I shouldn't call them tactics but some of the direct organizing principles 
that are part of Saul Alinsky's work um, and his organizing in communities. And all of that gets directly at what you're saying, at, at valuing the knowledge in the community and really thinking of this is a partnership where everyone brings knowledge to the table and that all of that knowledge is what's necessary to do the work. Um, and I did, you know, we today we focused really on sort of what are the themes across the interviews. In the individual interviews, I very much heard people talking about, you know, this is what I bring to the table. This is what my community partners bring to the table. And we do this work together. I wouldn't say that that happened across the interviews, but there was a, a large portion of the people that we talked to who, whose focus is very much a social justice focus and very much see the work that they're doing as addressing uh, power issues and uh, making progressive change in communities. So it's, it's happening. Mm -hmm. My question follows up on that. It's a good setup. Um, <laughs> the, the definitional aspects of how we do engage it, how we do the work we do is very important. And I come from the tradition of the extension approach and the extension model which as its heart traditionally has that two-way, very engaged um, component, although extension has been criticized as well um, nationally. And my question is whether you've had any insights in your data about faculty with formal extension appointments and how they work and function in different types of institutions, uh, perhaps in less research-intensive institution as well as a very research-intensive institution like MSU, and how they negotiate some of those definitional challenges or how they define their work within those kind of contexts. Maybe you didn't have enough extension, formally appointed extension faculty to say. But I was curious if you had any insights on that. You know, through my work with Campus Compact, um, in working with the extension faculty, one of the things that I found is as a result of faculty members from different campuses getting involved in the community that the extension agents who are faculty members throughout a particular state, and this was mostly my experience in Montana, that actually the resources that those extension faculty had in their communities ended up becoming a conduit for faculty from other institutions being involved in communities. So suddenly, um, you know, extension faculty who are located in different counties, I mean, they really have their finger on the pulse of the issues that go on in a particular state. And that a lot of times they ended up then becoming, you know, we have community campus and that they really became the link between the two. I think there's some really great examples of projects that have come up with the extension person who creates those links. And also extensions being recreated in a lot of communities. It, it's shifted from um, youth development, agricultural development, to community development. And a lot of the projects actually have a community development orientation. And so extension, I think, plays a really key role in that. So I think they can really become, in a way, a translator between the needs of the community and the needs of the campus. And in a way, they can be the gatekeeper to keeping, to getting back to your question, to keep, to keep reminded, you know, the university is just one piece of the pie here. I think extension people more so than anybody have that realization this is not about us helping them. This is about you know us working together. Well that kind of fits actually with, with my comments or I think we're rolling along here. Um, the way I heard someone here put it is um, you know, maybe not exactly in these words but it's really co-generation of knowledge. Uh -huh. Not just reciprocity. It is something really different. And what I think, you know, universities can bring, at least in the, the, the work I do, is more um, rigor, more empirical, um, you know, perspective, maybe, a, because I think um, everyone thinks they have knowledge and everyone believes they understand things, and I think, you know, they, the, the advantage that we may bring um, is to try to, you know, not only bring the knowledge of, of research, you know, into that discussion, but also um, really methodological mm -hmm. approaches that I think will help us really, you know, um, do things in a more informed way, mm -hmm. and, um, and be maybe you know maybe step up our evaluation methods and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and then another comment I had or question was, and maybe you'll get into this a little bit more, and that is how you define community because I think you know as you described the different people y you worked with. Um, you know, 
I think that's another area where, again, I think MSU is very good, and that is in terms of thinking of community in um, in very broad terms. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's the local community, sometimes it's the state, sometimes it's a community of interest, and that may be a national interest. Mm -hmm. right? um, and sometimes those communities are um, very knowledgeable and very um, uh, sophisticated communities, and in other cases, they may be, more, you know, there may be a service need that defines them or a um, educational need. So I think that's where I think the complexity also really comes in. What is your community and how do you define it? Mm -hmm. And are you um, defining it appropriately and, um, and then responding to that community? So I guess I'd be interested in how you viewed, you know, your sample in terms of the communities that they dealt with. How were they comparable? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think most of the people were involved in projects that were in what I would define as a local community orientation, but um, there certainly is a huge range. I mean, a lot of people are involved in international projects, so that they're working with particular communities of interest, or the, the community has some common element, but that um, how that's defined, it, it's really up, the community defines it. You know, it's not necessarily that the university says, you know, I'm going to go be with that community. So did you have any other comments about Well, it did very much, a uh, couple people talked about across their different projects that they were involved in, that, that the community they were interacting changed. And many, um, many, many people talked about it in lines, along lines that fit with what you were saying. Um, I want to go back to the comment that you were making about the bringing rigor to the process, because I, I think that was that's a really inter interesting intersection with some of the data that, that we haven't talked about previously. So one of our participants in particular does a lot of work with state level, and just, he's the guy that talks about educating the decision makers. He works a lot with state agency uh, personnel, and that's a big piece of his practice. Another sort of an equally big piece is working with small communities in a particular, well, he lives in a mostly rural state, but in a particularly, like a really rural place, so very small communities, I mean. Um, and he talked about seeing part of what he brought to that process is training those community members in the doing of research. So he talked about, he and his students collected data in a community, and then they didn't really do anything with that data themselves, other than, you know, put it into a format that was easily accessible easily accessible by a big group of people. And then they took it back to a community meeting and put these charts of numbers and whatnot that they collected up on the screen and then turned to the community and said, well, you tell me what this means. And through a interactive process like that, sort of guided the discussion so that it, it had the rigor of, of an analysis that somebody in the academy would find appropriate or that would stand up to peer review. But it was also a process where the community was learning to do that for themselves. And he said, and he specifically said, you know, maybe I'm working myself out of a job here, but I think that's a good thing to do. Um, and so we really, I, he's a sort of a perfect example of how that happened, but there was a lot of let's talk to our participants and help them, have them help us make sense of this so that it's meaningful, you know, so that it's meaningful within that community context and not just what I think as somebody who drives into town every other week or whatever. Okay, it's um, time for a refreshment break. So what we'd like to do is um, reconvene in 15 minutes and when you come back, there's gonna be table tents on the tables. Um, looking at different perspectives. And so what we want to do is talk about engagement and this idea of integrating teaching, research, and service with a community backdrop. And we want to talk about that from different um, stakeholder perspectives. So if you will select a table to sit at, at in a table either of what your own position is or where you think you want to have a conversation about how to advance um, conversations about engagement in that for that particular group of people. So we'll take a break, and then when you come back, there'll be table tents on the tables. There are great snacks out in the hall.